One thing we all have in common as Sega fans is the desire to see a return of Sega's arcade games that have never received a proper home release. Sega was a prolific producer of arcade hardware and software for decades, racking up an impressive list of must-play games that many of us loved. Unfortunately, many of these games remain unreleased on home hardware. In this episode, we will be looking at more games that are in terrible need of a home version for fans that have waited forever to own their very own copy. Not all these games were made by Sega, but did appear on Sega-made hardware. I hope you guys enjoy Locked Away Sega Arcade Games Part 2. In 1999, Psycho would produce the last Sega Model 2 arcade game ever with Pilot Kids. Released only in Japan, this is a 2.5D horizontal shoot 'em up that has two children flying toy planes and taking on normal everyday objects that have come to life and are trying to kill them. It features two player co op action and a lock on system for scoring that allows you to hit multiple enemies for score bonuses. The visuals here are quite tame compared to other Sega Model 2 efforts, particularly later life games such as House of the Dead and Wave Runner. It is colorful, and each level has a nice 3D feel to the backdrops that do set the tone well for the story. Gameplay almost solely relies on the lock-on scoring mechanic for variety, and the only advantage the main attack has is that it can destroy the orange bullets to help you get around easier. Blue bullets cannot be destroyed, and show up a lot more frequently halfway through the game. There are a ton of shoot 'em ups from the 90s that completely blow this away visually and in gameplay, but I wouldn't say this is a bad experience overall. I don't think there is really anything here the Saturn couldn't have done a decent job on, but it would have been more likely to appear on the Dreamcast given its 1999 release. Jellico would get in on some Model 2 action itself, releasing Over Rev in 1997. This is another Japan-only release that has never seen a home port. This one is a real shame too, because Over Rev is a damn good game. Almost a hybrid between Daytona and Ridge Racer, you get gameplay that feels very close to Sega's best, and a graphical style that often catches the look and feel of Namco's goodness. The track design is fun, and there are plenty of set pieces to catch your attention as you zoom around the track. You get seven cars to choose from, and each one has a distinct feel, not just in speed, but in handling as well. Stages range from super easy, pedal to the floorboard the entire time kind, to the oh my god I can't get off the damn wall to save my life variety. This gives Overrev a little something for everyone. And if you are a fan of arcade racers from the 90s, I'd go so far as to say this is a must play. I'd love to see somebody scoop up these kinds of old releases and give us an arcade pack of Lost Model 2 games. I'd buy it day one. As good as AM2 was for Sega, there are still games by this legendary studio that remain locked away, and F1 Exhaust Note is one of them. Released in 1991 on the awesome System 32 arcade board, this is a Formula One racing game that uses sprite scaling to provide a nice 3D feel to its gameplay. And man is that gameplay hard as can be. AM2 was always pretty tough with their games, making sure that your quarters were eaten up in timely fashion. But F1 Exhaust Note is about as hard as I've ever seen one of their games. It's utterly ruthless with its expectations of performance. Mess up once and you will not be coming in first. 
I like the look of this one, but the speed feels off compared to other AM2 efforts. It's slower, and the ass end of the car is right in your face with no option to change the viewpoint. This added to my frustration of trying to get a feel for it, which I'm sad to say never came. I spent nearly the entire time in last place, barely making the first lap checkpoint multiple times. I'd still love to see a home port with proper analog controls though. Remember Choplifter, the 2D shoot 'em up that had you rescuing your fellow soldiers in a helicopter? Well, Sega actually made a superscalar version of that called Air Rescue. It was released in 1992 on the System 32 arcade hardware and developed by Sega AM1. The premise here should be instantly recognizable by most of you. Clear the battlefield of hostiles, get your buddies, and get your asses home in one piece. The gameplay here takes a few deaths to get used to. Adjusting your height during battle takes some practice, and movement on the battlefield doesn't come as intuitive as you'd like. Once you do get the feel, you'll be shooting down bogeys and lighting tanks up like it's second nature. Stage variety is impressive, and you'll be seeing war-torn cities, jungles, and deserts as you progress. The superscaling power of the System 32 is on full display here, and provides a convincing 3D environment for you to fly around. It's no wonder Sega thought that making the Saturn a monster sprite manipulator was going to be enough for the next generation of machines. The games on the System 32 were nothing short of spectacular. The history of 3D fighters is almost always associated with the rise of polygon rendering in the arcade. Sega AM3 wants you to know that they did it before then. 1993's Dark Edge is a System 32 powered one-on-one -on -one fighting game that allows you to move around in 3D as you fight. The powerful sprite scaling simulates the look and feel of moving in full 3D, a complete 360 degrees around your opponent. This is an incredibly cool looking game to see for the first time, but man is it hard to get your head around a freaking 2D game that allows you to move in 3D space. One second you are to the left of your foe, the next second his right. A quick jump and he is right in front of you on the screen, and then another he's in the background. Keeping up with your screen position makes pulling off special moves quite difficult. Just because you were on the left when you start a special doesn't mean you're still there when you finish. The difficulty ramps up quickly too, and you'll be fighting a ruthless AI that is surgical in its precision. Later foes will eat you alive in mere seconds, adding a frustration to this one that can be almost unbearable. I love the look and feel of it though, and can play this for quite some time before rage quitting and crying myself to sleep. It's from an age where Sega made 2D games that felt 3D, and man was it way ahead of its time. First round. Sega was always into experimenting with new types of technology in the arcade, and one of their weirdest efforts was 1992's AM1-developed Holoseum. 
This is a one-on-one -on -one fighter that takes place in closed quarters, with no running away. It was developed on the System32 arcade hardware, and uses a series of mirrors to reflect an image that looks almost 3D. This trickery was so convincing, it looked almost as if you could reach out and touch the fighters. Holiseum otherwise isn't so much a game as it is a technology demo. There are only a handful of fighters, there are no backdrops, and fights are usually over in seconds. Gameplay takes the Street Fighter 2 path, with back blocking attacks and special moves performed with combinations of the joystick and buttons. Perhaps the weirdest part of this thing is the fact that it was produced for the US market and nowhere else. You'd think that this would have been a big hit in the still thriving Japanese arcade scene. I feel Sega also missed a big opportunity to bring this game out on the 3DS and expand the fighter list. I also would love to see it on VR. to see guys in good shape. Even as hard as I try to be educated on all things Sega related, there are still things out there that took me years to discover. This is the case with 1995's Slipstream, a System 32 developed racing game by none other than Capcom, and released only in South America. The first time my eyes saw the game, I thought it was running on early Polygon hardware. I mean, there are 5th generation Polygon racing games that don't look this damn good. Sprite scaling is often disjointed because of the way the sprites appear one after another as they scale towards the screen. Just take a look at what Capcom pulled off here. A truly convincing 3D environment made completely of 2 dimensional sprites. You want to know what else? This game plays great too. Far more forgiving than AM2's F1 exhaust note, this sets realism in the back seat and welcomes speed and track position as your main concerns. It plays more like Sega's 3D racing games than you'd ever guess, and even has a system in place for turbo boosts and slipstream bonuses when tailing a competitor. It's still tough, but you'll be having so much fun you won't care. A hidden gem if there ever was a game deserving the term. Another AM2 arcade game that wasn't brought home is 1990's GP Rider. Done on the venerable Sega X board, this is sort of an update to Yu Suzuki's previous work on Hang On. I was always mesmerized by this game when I saw it as a kid. It looks so damn cool, and the bike you rode just added to the appeal. Trying to play it now, the reality of things sobers you up pretty quickly. It's as hard as F1 Exhaust Note and only having one track really grates on the experience. This track was designed to be hard with nearly perfect opponents that rarely make a mistake. Placing in the top three requires an incredible amount of patience and dedication. I've had races where I've been almost perfect, yet still couldn't crack the top five. I still love to fire it up and just see it run and watch the visuals flash across the screen. That difficulty is just too much though and really impacts the enjoyment. The Sega Master System and Game Gear saw games named GP Rider in their day, but both these games were quite different in design, visuals, and gameplay. They only really share the same genre of motorcycle racing.
Sega and Weststone would join forces in 1990 to develop and release the System 16 shoot'em up All Rail. This long forgotten title has two forms of gameplay. The first is your overhead shooter. It allows you to move and shoot at the same time, but once stationary, you become a rapid fire killing machine. Of course, sitting still means you are also a sitting duck, so you'll need to balance your attack power between the single shots while moving and your much more powerful shots while sitting still. Your power bar allows you to keep your shield recharged so you can take a few hits, with enemies dropping fresh charges after you defeat them. Each area has a bunker that must be entered and pacified in first person view as well. You can move forward, left and right while picking up weapon and shield upgrades as you do battle with the enemies. This gives way to a boss encounter, usually a fight with an enemy much larger than you with far more firepower. It's a challenging reminder of how fun some of these old shooters could be, and you had to respect the attempt to spice up the gameplay with first person segments. It was only released in Japan and has never been released on a home system. In 1990, Sega internally developed the on-rails light gun shooter Laser Ghost for the System 18 arcade board. This in all intents and purposes is the predecessor to Sega's House of the Dead series, with even a story that goes damn near hand in hand with those later games. Here you get pretty much every kind of ghost, monster, zombie, and all other manner of gruesome foe coming at you. You are hot on the trails of a nasty ghost that has stolen the soul of a young girl. Three players can join in this blastathon, and you'll need tons of help to see the end. The screen stays filled with great looking sprites that scale frequently, adding a great 3D feel to the play area. Like other games in the genre, you'll get to the bad guy at the end of each level that takes a crazy amount of damage to kill and move on. Playing this brings back a hell of a load of memories. It's so cool to see what was essentially a two-dimensional House of the Dead, and the co-op multiplayer just adds to the fun. If there ever was a type of game that could launch Sega's VR Classics line, stuff like this is it. It's campy and simple, but retains a charm and playability that is nearly timeless. A Sega Master System version was released in 1991 in PAL territories, supporting the Sega Lite Phaser. Unfortunately, it was only one player and is a mere shell of the experience of the arcade. One thing that is often overlooked when discussing Sega's legacy is that they weren't just a console and software maker. Much of their arcade hardware was designed in-house, and every so often it would get licensed out to a few choice developers to work their own brand of magic with. Games like Slipstream and Overrev were the results of these deals, and an important part of Sega's legacy. This is especially true since many of these games, like Sega's own library, remain locked away from many of us. Only projects like Main keep these games alive for us, giving us a chance to go back and relive stuff we haven't seen in years, and in some cases not at all. I need to remind everyone that while the footage you have seen here is as close to the originals as I could get it, none of this emulation is perfect and will never be a full-on substitute for standing in front of a real arcade cabinet and experiencing these games as they were meant to be. The arcade was king, and always will be. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.